Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen, and thank you for being here on this lovely, beautiful March afternoon. Welcome to the IO Files. My name is David, and I'm the producer with Conjunction Media. We are live streaming it for all of our online audience this afternoon. And Gail with the Historical Society always gives me a couple of minutes to talk about what I do at Conjunction Media. First of all, the name Conjunction Media, that seems like a weird name. Well, in, uh, in astronomy, a conjunction is when the stars align. So what I like to say is I make the stars align for you. <laughs> and so with uh, at Conjunction Media, we specialize in educational and corporate productions. We've got a couple of award-winning uh, educational documentaries. We produced a series with the Historical Society last year. And we got a bunch more projects out there. So if you have any sort of educational organization you're affiliated with, give us a call and see what kind of production we could put together for you. I also have a corporate training arm where my master's degree was, I, I studied creative thinking and problem solving. And you know, I've had a lot of businesses contact me and say, hey, I'd like to work with our employees on creative thinking and problem solving. And so we've put together some great training programs for whatever business or organization you may be a part of. I've got a book called Activate Your Genius Mode that I keep at the back table. You're welcome to flip through. My contact information is always back there. And my website is conjunctionmedia.com. And thank you very much for giving me those two minutes. And now I will turn it over to Gail, who you're all here to see. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you, sir. No one is here to see me. You are all here to meet. Uh, it's a reality. I deal with it. You are all here to see Kate, um, who is just uh, a fantastic resource for our community. Kate Lavasser is a passionate explorer of history. Today's program is the third she has done on local cemeteries. And in her day job, other than raising a wonderful, adorable <laughs> child, she's the archivist at the World Food Prize Foundation, helping save and promote the work of Iowa's Dr. Norman Borlaug, and the critical work to, of the foundation in the fight against hunger and poverty. Kate is a local girl. She grew up in Clive and West Des Moines. She's a Valley graduate, and she also serves on the board of directors for the West Des Moines Historical Society. So she's my boss. <laughs> so be nice to her, okay? Um, I want to thank you all for coming here today, part of the Iowa Files, which is presented by the West Des Moines Historical Society. And thanks to funding from the Iowa Arts Council, our members and donors, EMC Insurance Foundation, and the Friends Foundation of the West Des Moines Public Library. We are able to present these live at no charge, and now we're streaming them live, thanks to Dave. So let's get to the meat of the cemetery matter and Kate Lavasser. <laughs> Well, again, I want to say welcome. I know it's a 70 degree day in March. There's March Madness going on. So I very much appreciate you all taking an hour of your day uh, to come spend it with me, learning a little bit about some of the famous and perhaps not so famous uh, residents, if you will, of some of our local historic cemeteries. Uh, as you can see from the title of the program, we are going to be talking about uh, both the Woodland Cemetery and Jordan Cemeteries. And uh, Woodland Cemetery, uh, is in Des Moines, whereas the Jordan Cemetery is here in West Des Moines, um, for those of you who may not be familiar um, with the cemeteries, and we'll talk a little bit more about those, a little bit of background coming up here. All right, I always like to start out with a bit of context because I'm a historian and that's what we do. So first of all, Woodland Cemetery uh, was, for, was created, as you can see, in 1848. So it was actually uh, one of the, it was the first cemetery uh, in Des Moines. So some of the burials you'll see in there are going to be uh, even older uh, than, of course, you might imagine the cemeteries in West Des Moines. Uh, currently, the cemetery is 69 acres with approximately 80,000 burials. It contains three sub-cemeteries, so uh, you'll have the Emanuel Jewish Cemetery, the St. Ambrose Catholic Cemetery, and the Odd Fellows Cemetery. Uh, the Odd Fellows were a fraternal organization, uh, so you'll see symbolism from the groups, kind of like you would see symbolism from Masons uh, on Masonic cemetery, uh, excuse me, Masonic headstones. Um, and so they uh, were an organization that was very prominent in especially uh, the 19th century. And then it was designated a local historic landmark in 1986. And actually my first cemetery program was about women uh, buried, specifically about women buried in Woodland Cemetery. Uh, it was going to be an actual walking tour, but because of COVID got switched to a webinar and that was how I kind of got started on this uh, cemetery webinar journey. 
Uh, the Jordan Cemetery, as I said, is here in West Des Moines, um, not too far from us right now, actually, on Fuller Road. It was established in 1855-ish, so uh, that's dated to some of the older burials in the cemetery. Um, it may have originally been intended as a family cemetery for the Jordan family, hence the name, uh, because one of those early burials is uh, James Jordan's first <coughs> wife, Melinda. Uh, it also could have been a place for pioneer burials. As you can imagine, as people were headed across the Midwest to uh, Oregon or wherever their westward travels were going to take them, they might need a place uh, if someone is lost along the way or someone passes uh, to be buried by their family and in as formal and respectful of a way as possible. Uh, the city of Valley Junction began administration in 1920 um, and by that I mean they were asked by an association to start taking on some of the financial responsibility from the cemetery at that time and now it is uh, administered by West Des Moines Parks and Recreation. Also, before we get started, I promise I won't linger too long, we'll get to the stories of the people. Um, just a few things to keep in mind whenever you're talking about historic cemeteries in the Des Moines area. Um, the Victorian era figures into it. So uh, for those that aren't familiar, the Victorian era took place between 1837 and 1901 named for Queen Victoria of England. So that was during her reign as queen. Uh, it was a, it's a major cultural time period, so there are some things about it that are relevant. Um, views of death is one thing. Uh, in this time period, of course, you have a different relationship with death as an everyday person walking down the street than we do today. Uh, in child rearing books of the time period, it was not uncommon to see instructions on how to acquaint your children with death, because unfortunately it was quite likely that they would lose siblings uh, friends, in addition to any adult relatives. So they're going to be much more, uh, I don't want to say familiar, but it's, it's part of their life and the ceremony around that is much more, it, it permeates their everyday life more than ours does today. Um, so the idea of cemeteries as social spaces, uh, if you've been to historic cemeteries, maybe you've seen some gravestones are like benches. Um, which today it seems a little uncomfortable for us to think, yes, let me go sit on, you know, grandpa or, uh, you know, great aunt Millie. But that was something that you're looking for in this time period, especially in the post-Civil War era in the United States. People were facing death on a scale that they never had before. And a way to keep those uh, deceased family members alive and involved, you might say, in their family culture was to go have picnics at the cemetery or go have that time with their deceased relatives. So having picnics at the cemetery was not an uncommon thing during this time period. Um, and actually, if you've ever looked at some cemetery rules, including the Jordan Cemetery now, they say no food. And that's because there was some social fallout uh, from this idea of having parties in the cemeteries. You can imagine uh, became maybe less about having you know, including that family in your celebrations and perhaps more about loitering or uh, vandalism. Uh, the final thought I'll leave us with or discussion here is cemeteries as museums. Uh, one of the reasons I am interested in history in cemeteries is the idea that this is one way, in addition to say, going to a historic home and seeing someone's china or seeing the bed they slept in, this is pretty much as close as you can get to being involved in the life of someone that has passed away, whether they're famous or someone in your own family. Uh, one of the challenges about this is generally the upkeep of a plot of a headstone falls to the family of the deceased. Well, what happens if there is no family left in the town? But what if it's someone historically prominent? I mean, if, if there was some, if the town of Des Moines was named after someone named Des Moines per se, and all of their relatives had died out or moved, we want to take care of that tombstone or their mausoleum or whatever is left because of the significance of the, the family, the person to our town. But if there's no money from the family to do that, then whose job is it? Whose financial responsibility is it? Whose moral responsibility is it? And how can we use the tombstone itself, um, the stories about the person to create a narrative that is interesting, respectful, and educational for those that are going to see it? The first section of our talk today is called, That Name Sounds Familiar, so we'll jump right in. 
So the first person I'll be discussing today is James Jordan. Uh, and I will say I am not the James Jordan expert, so definitely go visit the Jordan House. Um, there are many resources that I'm sure Gail would be able to share with you if you're interested in a more in-depth view of James Jordan's life. But it seemed wrong to not be, include Mr. Jordan in this presentation since the Jordan Cemetery is one of the cemeteries we're covering today. So James Jordan was originally from what is now West Virginia. It was a part of Virginia at the time of his birth, and he was an early settler in Iowa. In addition to cattle operations, which was what he made a lot of money off of, uh, he was also a business and civic leader as well as a politician. Um, he was a Whig uh, prior to the creation of the Republican Party. So we're thinking um, Abraham Lincoln Republican Party, um, you know, what the political parties would have been in the mid 19th century. Uh, most importantly, or perhaps what people know about him now, is that he was a staunch abolitionist, and his home in West Des Moines, which is the head of the West Des Moines Historical Society, or the headquarters, uh, was a stop on the Underground Railroad. And there's his portrait. And I think this goes without saying, but since I forgot to mention, he is buried in the Jordan Cemetery. <laughs> Um, some of the notable uh, projects that he worked in throughout his life that would be recognizable to uh, us today. He was instrumental in moving the Iowa capital from Iowa City to Des Moines as uh, the population of Iowa started to increase. They were looking to have a more central location and there were several different towns that were vying for it because as you can imagine, Becoming the capital was going to be great in terms of economy, attention, population. Uh, so it ultimately ended up being Des Moines and James Jordan was a politician that was instrumental in proposing it and getting that passed, as well as bringing a tie-ins to the railroad to make sure it was an economically advantageous situation for Des Moines. He also worked in the legislature that assisted uh, the Meskwaki tribe in purchasing the first 80 acres of their former uh, territory from the government in 1857, which as you can imagine was a, a very unusual uh, move in that time period. And he was also highly involved in the establishment of railroad lines in the area of what would become Valley Junction or today West Des Moines. Uh, part of that, as with a lot of people uh, that end up being uh, cattle farmers, that decide railroads would be really handy for them. That work initially started because he was donating land for a spur railroad to come to his farm so it would be easy for him to be able to get cattle to market. Uh, but the advantages were clear. Uh, you know, the railroad comes, that's business, that's money, that means your town is going to grow. The next person we'll be discussing is Abraham Clegg. Uh, so when I was growing up, uh, Clegg Park Elementary was close to my grandparents' house and we, my siblings and I would go play on the playground there. And so while it's no longer um, Clegg Park Elementary, the family's name does still uh, exist with Clegg Road, which is very close to that area off of 8th Street in West Des Moines. Uh, and the Cleggs, Abraham in particular, he used, uh, lived from 1825 to 1910. He came to Iowa with the Ashworth and Nuttall families in 1851. So Ashworth may be another name that you recognize uh, if you drive around, uh, drive around West Des Moines. And we'll just talk about them in a little bit here. Uh, they actually all came to central Iowa together um, and were connected through marriages and, and then they were related. Um, one of the things about Abraham, or Abram, as you see in some newspaper articles, is he built an octagonal house. Uh, and the newspaper articles I read about this, everyone was, had a lot of questions about this octagonal house. Uh, but it, ha it had one foot thick walls, a copper roof, and a basement with 20 foot ceilings, uh, torn down in 1936. So yeah, I mean, it, this is quite a house if you're yeah. building, you know, in a one, you know, one room log cabin before this. Um, some people, there were rumors that uh, this was a popular design on the prairie because you could see out of, you know, on all sides to defend yourself against attack or just to know what was coming. Um, but there, are, there really isn't one settled story on what it was that inspired him to build this unique home uh, from what I've been able to determine. If anyone else knows, please feel free to tell me. Where was it located? Sixth uh, and Ashworth would have been where it was. They tore it down when they were expanding the road. So, um, and then uh, one thing that was interesting that I found in my research was uh, a 1927 article that was published in the Register. Uh, a young Drake student 
a journalism student, his professor had a contest where they were all supposed to go home while they were on break, come up with an interesting story, and then present it to the class. And he won a prize with his, with his reporting on the Clegg house here. So um, as you can see, 1927 means that was after Abraham Clegg died. And I will mention in the fairness, I have not found any supporting information about what I'm about to tell you, but it's a pretty good story. So as long as we acknowledge it's a story, <laughs> could be a story, I'll share it with you. As you can see, haunted house is a buried treasure. So here's an excerpt. Mr. and Mrs. F. E. Gazelhart tenant the place. So they're the tenants of the home since this was after his death. And at times visitors stay with them. Several years ago, a policeman, his wife and small child stopped for the night. They were used second story and according to Mrs. Geiselhart, slept in different rooms on a Sounds were heard during the night. Nothing was thought of them until the family failed to put in their appearance for breakfast. Except found to be unoccupied and that apparently with the door locked. Investigation of the finding of the three inside somewhat incoherent and the door barricaded with all available furniture. As soon as they were able, explanations were made. Mysterious trampings, moanings, and screams had driven them together for companionship. Since that time, the rooms have remained unoccupied and are a litter of fallen stones and mortar frequented by mice and bats and sometimes used for storing seed corn. <laughs> so I felt it would be wrong for me not to share this story with you, uh, again, with the proper caveats. Uh, the article also included a story of buried treasure. Uh, this one, uh, again, I haven't found any supporting information from it, but the rumor was that Abraham Clegg did not believe in banks, and I don't have time to go into the banking history of the United States. Um, it's very complicated, but he didn't trust banks. So he tended to bury his, according to the article, he tended to bury his money in different spots around his yard. And uh, when the Mormons came through central Iowa, he was inspired, it doesn't say why, to go with them, you know, apart from maybe he was interested. Um, and then everyone decided it might be a good time to go try to find all that gold that he had left buried on his property if he wasn't going to be there uh, to safeguard it. So according to this article, um, it became kind of a, a hobby for people to try to find Abraham Clegg's lost treasure on his property. They even brought in, uh, they said soothsayer in the article, but I'm sure we would say a, a medium or a psychic today to try to find where it was. And the psychic said it was buried next to an unpainted building uh, and would be discovered one day, but it was not discovered prior to the house being and other buildings being torn down. So maybe we're just out of luck. <laughs> As promised, the Ashworths are next. Um, I'm going to speak about James and Charles Ashworth um, kind of as a unit, they were brothers. Uh, they were bachelor brothers, I should say. So they never got married and they lived together. Uh, they came to Iowa in 1851 as children, again in that group of Clegg, Ashworth, and Nuttall families. Uh, they never married and lived together, as I said, their entire lives. Um, by, they were quite prosperous farmers by the time uh, they were older. Uh, they jointly owned 1,500 acres, cattle, and were considered wealthy and generous benefactors for the community. Uh, and as you may have guessed, Ashworth Road is named in the family's honor. So not just specifically these two brothers, but the family as a whole. It was White Pole Road before that, in case anyone's heard that uh, before. And that's, they donated the money for Ashworth Pool. One of them did. Charles. Yes, Charles donated the money for Ashworth Pool after James died, because as you can imagine, he was the heir. Kidnapped. This is the, the fun story with the Ashworth brothers. Well, maybe not fun for Charles, but interesting for us, we'll say. So on October 9th, Charles Ashworth was held up at gunpoint. I should say of um, 1909. Charles Ashworth was held up at gunpoint in an alley uh, along with another man named Ed Wagner. And I've, you've, I've seen a couple different spellings of Wagner, uh, but the idea was they were walking along and Ed said, hey, I need you to come look at the, these pipes behind the building. And he said, okay, great. And then when they're back there looking at these pipes, a man jumps out with a gun and demands money. So uh, Wagner escaped to go inform others, get help. Uh, but Charles was taken to a vacant building where he was instructed to write a check for $1,000. Uh, beaten, he was tied to a bed, but he did manage to escape after three hours of uh, the 
And as the reading called him, kept coming in and out of the room and uh, Charles managed to loosen one of the restraints and then get out a window. Uh, later, Wagner was actually implicated at the case and was convicted after a failed insanity defense. Uh, some sources say he was not convicted, but the newspaper articles I read said he was convicted and then appealed. So um, you, can, you can take what you will with that. Um, the $5,000 check was found in the room where he held captive, stained with blood. So it was not cashed. And the Laval was the name of the holdup man, if you will. He ended up getting arrested and Charles identified him uh, at the police station. So uh, they didn't actually get any money out of this venture. Uh, and Charles made a comment to the newspaper that he traveled around the world and seen many different cultures, uh, had many different experiences, but he'd never been treated as roughly as he had been during this kidnapping. So it's quite a day for him. His brother James did find out about it early enough that he went to the bank and was able to say, so something's happening. <laughs> if anyone tries to bring in a check from my brother, don't cash it. So they might not have even been successful had Charles not been able to escape. Um, the next category we're gonna talk about is Civil War veterans. Uh, many people are familiar with the fact that Iowa sent the largest per capita number of Union soldiers into the Civil War. So there are usually in historic cemeteries a significant or a notable number of Union veterans. Uh, so ours are, are especially, I should say, um, Woodland Cemetery is known for having um, five Union generals, which considering the size of the cemetery, it's a very large number, the size of Iowa. So um, first we'll talk about Abraham Ashworth. So we're connecting back into the Ashworth family. Uh, so he is actually an older half brother of Charles and James that we just discussed. Uh, and so he was older enough that by the time the families came to Iowa, he was actually married already. So he wasn't young like the other brothers would have been. Um, he left Iowa soon after his family settled here to go join the California Gold Rush. Uh, he did return to Iowa the year prior to the Civil War starting, leaving again to, in 1862 to fight in the Civil War uh, in the Iowa 23rd Volunteer Infantry. So he came back and uh, married his wife, Mary. Uh, Original, initially, he was working on his father's farm, but then ended up making enough money to become, you know, have his own farm. Uh, otherwise, there weren't too many. You know, it, it was a fairly, what I'm sure he appreciated, regular existence after his early youthful adventures um, in the gold rush in the Civil War. Uh, and then this one is another West Des Moines resident, a notable West Des Moines resident. You can uh, see in the Jordan Cemetery. Uh, Franklin DeFord, or Cap as his nickname was, uh, he arrived in Des Moines with his, in the Des Moines area with his parents when he was about six months old. So as you can see, uh, that would have been very early times for settlement here in Iowa, right after statehood. Uh, he joined the union as a bugler, so you know he was probably fairly young when he began his service and then ended his Civil War career as a second lieutenant. And he was not satisfied with that being the end of his military career. So he actually stayed in the army after that and joined uh, Custer's regiment. So anyone familiar with George Armstrong Custer knows that usually that didn't end well for the people in his regiment, um, thanks to the Battle of the Little Bighorn. Uh, he managed to escape being massacred at the Battle of the Little Bighorn uh, because he had been sent to get help. So by the time he got back, he came back to find his company had been entirely uh, killed. So um, of course that was unfortunate. Uh, after he retired from military service, he returned to Valley Junction and became a tailor, a justice of the peace, and also served as city marshal and street commissioner. So um, he had a, a varied and exciting career as outside of West Des Moines and then came back and uh, became a, a very productive citizen here as well. Of course, it's Women's History Month, so we cannot forget to talk about the ladies. And I have two very interesting ladies to tell you about. So the first is Annie Savory. She was born in 1827 in England, but her family moved to New York when she was fairly young. Uh, and then she ended up marrying James Savory in 1853. And uh, they settled in Des Moines in, shortly after that. Uh, so James Savory was 
a real estate speculator early on in his career. So the first job that she had and he had was building a small hotel here in Des Moines, uh, which was the first Savory Hotel. Uh, so if any of you are familiar, there's the Renaissance Savory Hotel downtown Des Moines now, which is um, close to the Civic Center. Um, it's actually the third Savory Hotel. So <laughs> there have been several incarnations. So the first one was a very simple log building. And Annie's job was to do the day-to-day -day running of that business. So um, she had a good head for it. And she wasn't formally educated, but she loved reading and did everything she could to um, kind of amplify the, the meager education she received. Uh, she became fluent in French, uh, and eventually she did achieve higher education, but we'll get to that. Uh, so one thing that she did do relatively early is find an interest in women's suffrage, so uh, women getting the right to vote, and especially becoming a leader here in Polk County. Uh, so she gave her first speech in 1868, and this was a complicated time uh, for women's suffrage because it was after an amendment passed that gave suffrage to um, African-American men in particular, but it, the idea was universal men's suffrage. So um, there were a lot of women that chafed at that, especially wealthy white women uh, that were upset that they did not get the vote at this time period too. So it was a period of great division in the suffrage movement. Uh, and a lot of women at this point chose to become very active more publicly uh, for their support for the suffrage movement and to, to make it move forward. And so after 1868, she helped organize the Polk County Women's Suffrage Association in 1870. But then as you can see, she was expelled from the organization in 1871. Uh-oh. <laughs> so here's what happened. Um, is anyone familiar with Victoria Woodhull and the free love movement of the 1870s? I know free love sounds really exciting, but we're not talking about 1960s free love. Uh, so Victoria Woodhull generally agreed to be the first female candidate for president. Uh, if you're getting technical, some people don't consider her to be a first actual or a legitimate candidate because she was actually younger than 35 when she ran. So even were it legal for her uh, she would have been elected at that point in time. She would not have met the age requirement until after assuming office. So, but she was the first in any traction. And when we say free love in this time period, what we're meaning is Victoria Woodhull and her associates said that the government didn't have the right to interfere in marriage, divorce, and children. Uh, so today we still might say, well, that sounds a little crazy. But uh, for those that know about women, uh, you know what women's life were like in this time period, especially in regards to children and divorce. You know, in the worst case scenario, if your husband is abusive, um, there's really nothing you can do about it. If you're getting divorced, usually that's gonna fall back on you poorly. It's gonna be bad for your reputation. It might be hard to get married again. It might be hard to support yourself. And a lot of the time children were considered your husband's property. So you could choose to Keep your children, you might never see your children again if you get divorced. So um, one of the things that Victoria Woodhull was saying was, no one should tell me that I'm stuck in a potentially horrible situation just because I want to extricate myself from a bad marriage, a bad husband, uh, an unfortunate situation. So when we say free love, yes, there were some components of it at the time period that would have been considered morally inappropriate from a Victorian standpoint, but a lot more of it was about women being able to support themselves and not having to uh, rely on uh, the legal relationship of, of marriage at that point in time. So what Annie's thought was, and along with um, Elizabeth Cady Stanton and Susan B. Anthony, who are perhaps more recognizable names for the women's suffrage movement at this point in time, they said, yes, it doesn't matter. If you're for women's suffrage, you should be invited into our movement and you should be allowed to work for this cause. However, there were some more conservative components here in Polk County in particular, all over the country, but specifically as related to Annie, um, that said, whoa, that is sketchy moral territory we don't agree with the free love movement. We say that anyone that agrees with that should be not welcome in our group. But Annie stuck to her guns and said, look, it's not really our business. These women wanna show up and help. We should let them in. So she was expelled for that belief. 
because the rest of the organization was a little more conservative. So after that, she kind of had to lick her wounds a little bit, but she was back figuring out how she could help women in Polk County. Uh, so in 1875, she was actually one of two women to graduate from the University of Iowa Law School. And her interest was not so much to become an attorney. She didn't necessarily want to go into court and argue cases. She wanted to know the law so she could ensure that women had all the information they needed uh, to stand up for themselves in court again if they needed to get a divorce, if they needed to be aware of their rights. So that was why she went to law school. Um, I didn't put this up here, but another thing she did is she actually started her own apiary on the grounds of the Hotel Savory uh, to promote beekeeping as a way that women could support themselves even if they lived in town. So she was a proponent of beekeeping as a way for women to have an independent economy. Um, she, yes? Yeah, so the question, the question for the online audience is, it, did Annie Savory stay married? Uh, yes, she actually did. She and her husband stayed married. Uh, it was a till death do the part situation. And uh, she actually worked alongside him in pretty much all of his businesses. And he ended up, they both ended up losing quite a bit of money. They meaning the sense of their family economy. Um, there was a big recession in the 1870s. So I'm kind of feeling the aftershocks from this time period. Uh, so they actually ended up leaving Des Moines, moving to Montana. He made a bunch of money again. They ended up in New York. So she actually died in New York, but Des Moines was, they, was where they felt their home was. So the Savory Mausoleum is here in Woodland Cemetery. Yes, excellent question. And she's in the Iowa Women's Hall of Fame as well. Um, Delia Webster is a new addition to my um, Hall of interesting women buried in Woodland Cemetery. Um, Delia is the lower left-hand corner here. Uh, so she was born in 1817 in Vermont. Um, she's buried in women's Woodland Cemetery as well, sorry. Um, and she was a highly educated woman of her time, even attending college in Ohio. Uh, she began working with the Reverend Calvin Fairbank to help enslaved people escape to freedom while living in Kentucky in the 1840s. And here we get to the, the juicy bit, if you will. She was the first woman arrested for assisting freedom seekers and sentenced to two years hard labor. So as you can imagine, in the 1840s, that is very unusual. For I mean, there's a general Victorian prejudice against women getting in trouble for this kind of thing because they're supposed to be the, the moral center of families and society. So you're not usually seeing women are causing this kind of trouble running around. Uh, but... <laughs> she was quite a character. Uh, so in addition to these very strong abolitionist beliefs, uh, while she's in prison, she just it can't be housed with the other inmates. As you can imagine, she's the one woman that's in the Kentucky penitentiary. Uh, her hard labor is perhaps not quite as hard as the labor of the male prisoners. She was sewing shirts um, if she was doing labor at all. But she ended up striking up a very interesting friendship with the keeper of the penitentiary, whose name is Newton Craig. And there's some concern for her safety because Newton Craig was actually um, related by marriage and a close associate with some of who, what you might consider um, Delia's um, arch nemeses, if you will, people that put her in prison. Um, so there was a lot of concern that that could be a problem. He was also uh, very religious. He would often go around giving sermons to inmates in hopes that um, it might inspire them to lead a more, uh, more productive life. Um, but as you can see, she served less than two months of her sentence before being pardoned. Strangely enough, one of the strongest proponents for that pardon was Newton Craig himself. What gives? <laughs> So we'll talk about that in a second. Uh, she continued with her work, the, her abolitionist or anti-slavery work for the rest of her life. Uh, so you may ask, how did she end up here in Des Moines? It seems like Kentucky is where she's doing a lot of this work. Well, she never married and one of her sisters uh, lived here in Iowa. And so at the end of her life, um, you might call her circumstances genteel poverty. So she was reliant without a husband. Um, she was reliant on her family members to support her um, in addition to any money she would have made herself. Uh, but she was living with a sister and then ended up living uh, out the last few years of her life with her niece, Dr. Alice Goodrich, 
who was an amazing woman herself. She was actually the first woman to graduate from the University of Iowa Medical School. So clearly something ran in this family of ladies. Uh, so, but just for a little more information on Delia Newton Craig. So during her imprisonment, Webster seems to have become quite close to Newton Craig. Um, despite his anti-abolitionist views, something that should have made him an enemy, he petitioned the governor to have her pardoned. They continued corresponding uh, in the years after her release. He even asked that she come back to Kentucky, and he loaned her $1,100 to buy a farm. The two eventually fell out, and Webster turned over some very personal letters uh, to his opponents when he was running uh, to be reelected as the keeper of the penitentiary. Uh, so he said, there was nothing physical in our relationship, but it did not matter. <laughs> the damage had been done. Um, and that's not to say that Delia didn't receive any blowback. Um, there was a general thought that she was a promiscuous woman. And there were some lawyers that were afraid to be alone in the room with her, even to talk about her own defense. It's possible she got arrested a few more times, but um, I could do a whole presentation on Delia. But, um, and I will also add there as a caveat, uh, it was very easy at this time, again, with those Victorian morals, to say a woman that was perhaps a little independent, it was easy also to say she was immoral because a, a proper Victorian woman acted a certain way and she wouldn't be immoral. So if you have a woman that's acting perhaps a little uppity, perhaps a little more independently, um, it was pretty easy to start piling on other accusations uh, uh, as well. Um, whether or not they were true. But it seems like there's a couple of other gentlemen that maybe people were rumored to ha that people had decided were having an affairs with Delia. So there's no confirmation. So you just have to look at her. She had a very interesting life doing very important work and was, is a very interesting person to learn about. All right, so our last story is for our true crime fans, which is very popular in these days. Uh, and so we're going to discuss tragedy in Boonville. Um, I don't have a photo of the tombstone or of Mr. and Mrs. Elmer Jameson. Um, interestingly enough, I found out about the Jamesons just doing a keyword search on Jordan Cemetery on a newspaper database, because sometimes you just never know what you're going to happen upon. Uh, interestingly enough, um, I have not been able to locate where in the cemetery they're buried, so I don't know if something has happened, like their bodies were moved or just the location has been lost since this happened. So I'll just say that as a caveat. But the newspaper, several newspapers reported that they were buried in Jordan Cemetery, and that is why I'm bringing this story to you today. Um, so their death was in 1909, and I don't have birth dates for either of them. Uh, but on June 29th in 1909, a man named Calvin Littlepage took a revolver, or maybe a rifle, the newspaper accounts were not uh, consistent, and rode out to the home of his former in-laws out near Boonville, demanding to see their daughter, Vernona, who is his ex-wife, as well as his infant daughter. Uh, when Mr. Jameson refused, Little Page shot both Jamesons. They were out in the yard. As you can imagine, when your ex-son-in-law comes up to you with a gun and says, can I see your daughter? <laughs> Her father said no. Uh, so after that, he then forced his ex-wife and daughter into a buggy that he had brought and drove them around the countryside for several hours, threatening them with harm. Uh, after a while, though, he then returned them to the farmhouse and drove away. Uh, by this point, several neighbors who had seen him driving around with a gun on his lap uh, raised a posse. So we're talking, I mean, I'm quoting the newspaper when I say pitchforks, <laughs> you know, angry mob, uh, pitchforks guns, uh, they even got the authorities, someone was sent to get the authorities in both Valley Junction and Des Moines uh, to assist. Uh, one newspaper article specifically mentioned that they were bringing their auto, their brand new auto patrol. So they had three police officers in a car coming to try to track down uh, Calvin Littlepage. Um, Littlepage's body was soon found near Valley Junction, dead by his own hand. Uh, and he was buried without a stone in Glendale Cemetery. Uh, and this was a big deal. It was reported in newspapers all over the country, even as far away as British Columbia in Canada. So here's a clip, and it might be somewhat difficult to read, uh, but this is one of the shorter accounts of the funeral. 
the pro says it says the procession to the Jordan Cemetery was over two miles long. So um, Boonville is a little out to the west. So they held the the funeral ceremony at their home. They did it outside because of the number of people that attended. Uh, some accounts say over 1,500 people attended this funeral. And then, like I said, a two mile long procession from Boonville to the Jordan Cemetery where they were laid to rest. Um, I appreciate the language. The Victorian language is always great. It's the summit of human pathos was received at a funeral service out west of Valley Junction yesterday afternoon. And it says Mrs. Calvin Little Page, but it should be Calvin, uh, with her babe, stripped by death of the three beings most dear to her through the hand of her husband, a murderer, stood besides two caskets, and for the last time, gazed upon the forms of her father and mother. The funeral of Mr. and Mrs. Elmer Jameson was held in the open air in a beautiful grove back of the little country home. 1,500 men, women, and children were there. The procession to Jordan Cemetery was two miles long, the longest in the history of Dallas County. It was the first time the wife of the murderer had looked upon the bodies of her parents since the tragedy Wednesday at the cemetery. Both bodies were lowered simultaneously into one grave. So, like I said, a little, a little true crime for you here um, to end uh, at least this part of the presentation. All right. Does anyone have any questions for me? No pressure. Did you do any tours of the cemetery? Uh, so I was about to do it, like as I mentioned, a tour of the uh, Glendale, or excuse me, Woodland Cemetery. Um, since it is administered by Parks and Rec, it has to go through them. And um, so they have their own rules for it. So I have not actually given a physical tour yet, but I'm not opposed to it. Um, and so we'll see what's coming on the horizon for anything with Jordan Cemetery. Yeah. Yes. 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 Had you ever had a chance to work with him and any of the history that this has shown? Because he was raised in the company that was responsible for a lot of the monuments. Yes. Okay. For my online folks, the question was if I had had a chance to uh, work with Gerald LeBlanc, who did several cemetery tours at Woodland over the years. Um, I did not have the pleasure of taking a tour with Gerald LeBlanc. I have been on tours with Archie Cook who kind of took the baton from him for, for Woodland Cemetery tours. Um, I was actually inspired by Archie Cook to get into doing this sort of research in the sense uh, that there are so many wonderful people to talk about that are or interesting people to talk about in Woodland Cemetery. Uh, and I had worked at Living History Farms and was um, the supervisor at the Flynn Mansion uh, prior, in, a, in a former work life. And so I was very interested in Victorian women um, and so I wanted to make sure there was space being carved out to talk about Victorian women and their accomplishments um, outside of that kind of domestic sphere of, of influence. So uh, I never want there to be a mistake that there weren't significant women in that time period or um, significant you know, people that aren't white. Um, so it's just the idea of leaving more room at the table to have those conversations. So that's what got me started in this was being able to talk about um, women specifically. And then I thought, hey, this is really interesting to be able to use kind of these cemeteries as a starting point for research, especially when you do Glendale Cemetery for those that are familiar. It's a very, very large cemetery. So um, I was then able to do a, a tour of some, um, a variety of people, a tour, virtual tour webinar <laughs> of a variety of people in Glendale Cemetery as well. Well, if anyone thinks of anything, I can definitely uh, answer questions one on one afterwards, too. I, but. I have to brag. Uh, <laughs> Delia Webster is one of the people that uh, West Des Moines Historical Society Mentoring Project discovered and documented, which led to Woodland Cemetery being added to the National Park Service's Network to Freedom. Yes. Recognizing underground railroad spots yeah. in the United States. So that was a mentoring program that we facilitated and got Newton Union Cemetery and Woodland Cemetery added to the Network to Freedom. Yes, and I was very mad that I found out about Delia after I did that Women of Woodland's first webinar because this is the first chance I've actually had to present on her. Um, because, like I said, she's a character and her story is very, very interesting. Actually, yes, <laughs> distantly, they are from that same, that Webster family, yep, yes. New England. 
All right, well, thank you so much. Like I said, if anyone comes up with any other questions, please feel free to ask Gail. Did you have anything else you wanted to say? Oh, thank you. You stand right there so oh. I can use your mic. Oh, okay. So thank you so much for coming today, um, buddies. <laughs> um, the, just so you know, the West Des Moines Parks and Recreation has a really good self-guided tour of the Jordan Cemetery. You can find it online. that has more notables on it. It's an amazing place to go through. Um, our next program, some of you may have had uh, an older schedule. It is on Sunday, April 10th, and it is about one-room schools. Bill Sherman, who is the go-to guy about one-room schools in Iowa, will be presenting. Um, you know, at some point, Iowa had over 1,200 one room, well, wait, no, 12,000 one room schools. Mm -hmm. Add another zero to that. So they were a major part of life in the late 18th, early 19th, early 20th century. So uh, come see that. Again, it'll be live streamed. If you would like any information about the Jordan House, we have tours on Fridays and Sundays. There's information back there. Sign up to become part of our email list. I don't sell your email. I am not Amazon, I promise. <laughs> and we just let you know about more programs and things that we have going on. So we've got some really exciting things. Uh, we just opened up at the Jordan House a quilt show, which will be open until June 12th. So come see some amazing quilted items that are presented by the Des Moines Area Quilters Guild. And we're going to be announcing tomorrow a live auction that we're going to be doing mm -hmm. to help bring together uh, some amazing programs and projects. So please consider becoming a member and supporting us. It's our members that make us be able to do things like this and answer people's questions like that lady. I know you know what I'm going to say. No? <laughs> <laughs> no. <laughs> no, I got involved um, in, in helping with the gardens over at Jordan mm -hmm. House and at Bennett School. So if anybody's interested in helping and you just want to come and read or whatever, please go. Very relaxing. <laughs> yes. So, yeah. yeah, it's going to be really gorgeous this year. So um, if you have any plants that you would like to donate to us, we'll take those as well. So thank you so much on behalf of the West Des Moines Historical Society. Thank yes, you, Kate, thank for your you. wonderful program. And go have a wonderful day. Yeah. Thanks.